I'd like to say hi to all of our campuses. You know, we're adding two more in December, and we'll now have 16 Saddlebacks uh, in Southern California and around the world. If you take out your message notes inside your program, we're gonna be part two in the series we started last week. Now, what would you think if I were to announce this weekend this? I've just read an incredible self-help book and this book tells me that I can be anything that I wanna be if I just really desire it and work really hard. I can become anything I wanna be. So, this weekend, I'm leaving Saddleback Church to go become a ballerina on Broadway. <laughs> How would you react to that? And if I said, God told me that I'm gonna be a ballerina on Broadway, you would say, Rick, what have you been smoking? <laughs> because it would be ludicrous for me to announce that I was gonna become a ballerina on Broadway because I really, really wanted to be it and uh, I was gonna work really hard. It would be ludicrous for three reasons. Number one, I'm not shaped to be a ballerina. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I'm not big enough. I'm not shaped, I'm not gifted to be a ballerina. I really am not one of these people with good balance. I, I don't have good balance, I never have all my life. And uh, it takes incredible physical balance to be a ballerina. I'm not gifted, I'm not talented. And the third thing is I've never learned the skills, so clearly this would be disastrous. Now, we do this all the time in other areas. I talk to people says, who say, I like to eat bagels, so I'm gonna start a bagel shop. Just because you like pie, or because you can even bake a pie, doesn't mean you should start a pie business. Those are two different animals. Just because um, you like, you admire, or you desire a certain career, doesn't mean you should acquire that career. There are a lot more skills involved in a building a business. Now last week we started this new series called Eight Skills That You Need to Succeed in Life and in Work. And our theme verse is Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. It's there at the top of your outline. We covered the full verse last week. If the ax is dull and its edge is unsharpened, more strength is required, but skill will bring success. One of the keys to succeeding in life is you have to be skilled. Desire is not enough, dedication is not enough, prayer is not enough, working hard, all these things are part of it, but you've got to have the right skills. And you could be the most sincere person in the world and if you don't have the right life skills, you're gonna fail at life. And if you don't have the right work skills, you're gonna fail at work. If you don't have the right ministry skills, you'll fail in ministry. The Bible says skill, not dedication, skill will bring success. Now, the good news is skills can be learned. And that's what we're gonna look at for these eight weeks, eight skills that you need to succeed in life and work. And today, we're gonna look at the second essential skill. And it is this, knowing how to recognize what's important and what's not important. I can't tell you how important this skill is and how few people have it. To look at a situation, go, that's important, that's not. That matters, that doesn't matter. That's valuable, that's not valuable. This is crucial, that's not crucial. Leaders know what's important. And they focus on that and they forget everything else. Successful people know what matters and don't worry about what doesn't matter. Paul says, this one thing I do, not these 40 things I dabble in. He is focused, he's laser focused. And you have to learn this skill in life to be successful at work and at, at home uh, and, and in life. The skill of knowing what matters most. Now, have you noticed that you don't have time to do everything? Yeah, of course you have. You have noticed this in life. The good news is this, 
God doesn't expect you to do everything. And there are only a few things in life worth doing in the first place. God hasn't called you to do everything in life. He's called you to do what he's called you to do, what you're gifted, what you're shaped. We're gonna talk about that in the future. And what's important in life. Knowing what matters most is extremely important. Look at this verse on the screen. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 says this. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. What does that mean? You're free to do anything with your life. God isn't gonna force you to do anything with your life. It's all permitted. You can waste your life, you can invest your life, you can spend your life. Everything's permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Some things in life are not necessarily wrong. They're not necessary. And oftentimes, we give first-class allegiance to second-class causes, and those causes betray us. I talked to one time to a guy who said, I climbed the ladder of success, and when I got to the top, it was leaning against the wrong wall. Not everything is worth doing. And so you can save yourself a lot of time, a lot of energy, if you learn the skill of knowing what's important and what's not important, knowing what's valuable, what's not valuable, what matters and what doesn't matter. Selection is a key to success in life because you don't have time for everything. And selection, just like these other skills, is a skill that you can learn. The better you get at selection, and prioritizing what matters in your life and what doesn't matter, the more effective you're going to be as a person, as a partner, as a parent, as a leader in life. You know, I thought since uh, we were talking about prioritization, I would show you a screenshot uh, of the four folders on the top of my computer desktop. Can we put that picture up? This is my desktop, and there are actually four, four folders on my desktop. Number one is things God wants me to do. Number two is things people I love need me to do. Third is things I want to do. And four is things everybody else wants me to do. Which of those four do you think has the most? Number four. Which is the least important? Number four. And that's when people say, can you write an endorsement for this book? Can you do this for me? They're not even people I know a lot of times, but they want me to do something. You have to know, what does God want me to do? What do the people I love need me to do? What do I want to do? There's a legitimate part for that. And then what does everybody else want me to do? And God has not called you to fulfill everybody else's will for their life. Does that make sense? So what I want us to do this weekend is talk about how do you discover what matters and what doesn't matter, what's valuable and what's not valuable, what, what is important and what's not important. You see, every time you make a decision, what we're talking about here is clarifying your values. Every single time you make a decision, you are basing it on unspoken values. You have a grid in your mind. You've never even thought about this, most likely. But you have a set of values in your mind, and every time you make a decision, I'm gonna do this and not do that. I'm gonna buy this and not buy that. I'm gonna spend my time and effort and energy on this and not on that. You are showing your hidden values. The problem is most people have never figured out what they are, where they came from, and whether they're valid or not. So really the secret of success is clarifying your values. This is a skill you need to learn. What is valuable to me and what is not valuable. Every time you make a decision, you reveal your values. My question is, do you know where your values came from? Are they, how are they working out? Is your life working out with those values? Uh, do you know where you picked them up? Are they working for you? Your values in life determine your stress, determine your success, and determine your salvation. Now, you may not realize this, but your values could be causing stress in your life. Unclear values cause confusion. They cause confusion in your life. Conflicting values in your life cause tension. Unclear cause confusion. Conflicting values cause tension. False values create deception. And the wrong values create dysfunction. So it's extremely important. What I'm talking to you about this weekend is very vital to the rest of your life. Last, lasting success, and as your pastor, I want you to succeed in life. Lasting success is built on values that last. 
And a lot of the values that our world has aren't, aren't lasting values. So what I wanna do this weekend is give you four questions. I want you to write these questions down to evaluate your values. When we talk about evaluate, you are valuing your values. Values. You evaluate means to judge your own values. So let me give you four questions that are gonna determine your values and your destiny. Number one, here's the first question you wanna ask yourself in knowing what matters most. First question, who is gonna be my authority? That's the fundamental question of life. Who is going to be my authority? In other words, where am I gonna get my values? Now there are a lot of different sources on which you can determine what values you're gonna live by. Some of your values you pick up from your parents. Some of, you, some of them you pick up from peers. Some of your values you picked up at school. Some of your values you picked up from books and magazines and movies and television shows. Today, the number one source of values today in the generations growing up, you know what it is? The media. The media are determining the values of the next generation uh, in, in the world today. That's the thing. Now you have to decide, you have to choose what's gonna be the source of my values. Because a poor source will give you poor values. The source determines the quality. Does this make sense? Where you get your, I mean, I could go down to an, uh, you know, a, a, a street corner in LA and, and learn my values from a drug pusher. They're not gonna be very reliable values, but I could learn them. The source would determine the quality of my values. So the first step, if you wanna succeed in life, you wanna know what's important, is you gotta decide where you're gonna get your values. And you have three options. Here are the three options. The first option in determining my values is me, myself. So write that down, myself. You can just get your values from yourself. And you can actually say, you know what? I'm gonna depend on my gut to always know the right thing to do. And some people do this. They get all their values from within. I'm just gonna depend on my gut to always know the right thing to do. Question, how's that working out for you? Are, are, are you hitting any dead ends? Are, 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 are all your plans coming out exactly the way you planned them to be? Are all your dreams coming true? Because you're depending on you for your values. Have all your plans succeeded? The Bible says in Jeremiah 11, 17, verse nine, the human mind, this is a God's word translation, the human mind is the most deceitful of all things. It is incurable. No one can understand how deceitful it really is. Now I want you to circle the word deceitful because I want to give you the definition of that word. It says the human mind is the most deceitful of all things. Nobody can understand how deceitful it is. What does deceitful mean? Well, let me give you a definition. The word deceitful means to mislead in the wrong direction. That's Webster's definition. It means to mislead in the wrong direction. Does your mind ever do that? Oh baby, oh baby, oh baby. Yes it does. Your mind often leads you in the wrong direction. I don't know if you, you follow all these recent brain studies, but I, I read these technical reports, I read articles, magazines, read scientific journals on it, and in the last five years, there have been enormous breakthroughs in understanding the brain. I think part of it was because Matthew struggled with mental illness. I've just always been interested in, in the brain. And in the last five years, study after study after study after study has proven that your perceptions are wrong more than they're right in life. Every single brain study is proving this, that your brain lies to you. You get it wrong more often than you get it right. The way you perceive yourself, the way you perceive others, the way you perceive your relationships, the way you perceive your problems, the way you perceive the world. Study after study shows our brain isn't that good at getting it accurate. That just because you tell yourself something about a problem, about a person, about a relationship, about money, about anything, doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean it's correct. 
You lie to yourself all the time. In fact, you lie to yourself more than you lie to anybody else. Now, this is not new news because thousands of years ago, the, God said the human mind is the most deceitful of all things. It misleads us in the wrong direction. You say, but I saw it. I heard it. Well, you could have misheard it and you could have misseen it. Both your eyes and your ears lie. Any attorney can prove this by using multiple witnesses. You can have an accident take place and you can have people on four different corners and they all see the accident and they're gonna tell you four different stories. Which one was right? We see what we think we see. We perceive what we think we perceive. We hear the stuff I'm telling you right now, what I'm saying, you're not actually even hearing it the way I'm saying it. You're hearing it the way you receive it. And so it's not highly reliable to base your values on yourself because you don't always see reality as it really is. Growing up, you were told things about you and you believed them. They weren't true, but you believed them. And you've told other people and people told you things that were about you that really weren't true, but you believed it. And so your perceptions are not always reality. I mean, you might say, I know what's causing my problem. Well, the fact is you probably don't. You need an authority bigger than yourself because we all misjudge. We misjudge events, we misjudge pain, we misjudge people, we misjudge motives. In fact, you might wanna write this down. My perceptions say more about me than others. My perceptions say more about me than others because I have this grid in my mind and I see things the way I see it which doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth. So if I build my life that I'm the final authority of what's right and what's wrong, what's true and false, what's good and bad, what's valuable and invaluable, I'm, I'm on sinking sands. I gotta have a source of authority outside myself. That's not enough, because we all misjudge. The Bible says this, look here on the screen, Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seems right to humans but in the end, it leads to death. A lot of plans that you've had were dead ends. A lot of plans I've had were dead ends. It seemed the right thing. So you can't just depend on your own gut. Your perceptions can lead to dead ends. What you need is the truth. That's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, on your own perception, on how you think it's, it is seen. So the first possible source, it's not very reliable, is uh, I'll be the source of all my values and I'll determine what reality is. The second source, you can write this one down, it's a possible source, is the world. And uh, most of the time we get our values from the world. In other words, what does everybody else think is valuable? What does everybody else consider important? If they consider it important, it must be important to me. If they consider it valuable, it must be valuable to me. Now, 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16 says this. Don't love what the world offers and values. Do not love what the world offers and values. Those who love the world don't have the Father's love in them. For what the world values, and it lists three things, physical gratification, we see that, greed, materialism, and prideful, self-centered lifestyles. What the world values does not come from the Father. Now this verse shows us um, three of the world's values. You might write these down. Here, here's, if you're gonna base your values on what the world says, what culture says, what pop culture says, here's what you're gonna get. The first thing the world values is this, looking good, looking good. The world values appearance. The world values appearance. It's why billions are spent on beauty aids and surgeries and clothes. But the truth is most of us aren't part of the beautiful people. We're not as attractive as the superstars. We're just kind of average looking. And so the world doesn't value you 
or me like it values the beautiful people. You're probably not going to get your picture in People magazine or Us or on the cover of some beauty magazine. And the world says, because you're not that beautiful, you don't matter. You aren't as valuable as the prom queen, as the cheerleader, as the sexy starlet, or the incredible hunk, Rick Warren. <laughs> so the world values appearance, beauty. And the Bible says, no, no, that's not the important value. The second thing that the world values is not just looking good, but feeling good. Feeling good. And of course, that's pleasure and that's sex. I don't have to convince you that sex dominates our society. Everybody agree with that? I mean, it is used to sell spark plugs <laughs> and dishwashing soap and everything else. And, you know, people taking a shower and they're shampooing. It's like they're having some kind of experience. And you go, whoo you know, and it, sex is used literally to sell everything. Why? Because it's the second big value. I just want to have fun. And if you say, well, my number one goal in life is happiness, you've bought into the world's value system, which says that happiness, feeling good, is more important than doing things right or correct or anything else. You know, it's not by accident that in our culture today, our largest industry is entertainment. It's entertainment because we want to feel good. So the world system is looking good, appearance, feeling good, pleasure and sex. And the third value of the world is having the goods. In other words, materialism, money, wealth, riches, prosperity. We are conspicuous about our consumption. People like to show it off. They want to show off their cars, show off their clothes, their homes, their jewelry, their, their front lawn, except in Southern California, <laughs> where we're ashamed of having a lawn. <laughs> and we, we want to base our self-worth on our net worth, and we think that our value is connected to our valuables. It isn't. But that's what the world teaches. Money, sex, Power, or passion, possession, position, sex, salary, status. This is what the world values. This is what every advertisement promotes. Now here's the problem. Since you're constantly bombarded by the media with these three values about appearance, you gotta look good, you gotta feel good, and you gotta have the goods, even Christians get seduced by those values. And all of a sudden we think that's the whole purpose of life, to look good, to feel good, and have the goods. And that is not at all what God put you on this planet for. Now there's a third possible source for your values. And of course that's God, particularly God's word. And God's word is a far more objective, truthful, not uh, uh, you know, given sway to your perceptions or the world's opinions. God's word, Jesus said it like this in John 8. If you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now, what does God say about these values? Well, I just thought I'd quickly give these verses to you. What does God say about appearance and beauty? 1 Samuel 6, 7, 16, 7. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? God doesn't care about your appearance. He doesn't care about your appearance. God says it's not about appearance. He says it's not about making pleasure your highest value. Hebrews eleven twenty five. 25. The pleasures of sin only last for a short time. They're not gonna last. Yeah, it's fun, but gonna, you have your kicks, but they'll be the kickbacks. And God says it's not about wealth. It's not about materialism. Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, real life is not measured by how much we own. In other words, the greatest things in life aren't things. So the first question I need to ask is, who's gonna be my authority? Myself, that's pretty shaky. The world, uh, that's just the opinion of other people. Or is it gonna be God's word? Now, the second question you wanna ask is this. What's going to last the longest? What's going to last the longest? 
This is an important question to ask if you're trying to decide what you're gonna build your values on, what's gonna be important. And if you wanna know what matters most, what doesn't matter, you need to invest your life in something that's gonna last the longest. Now, let me be honest with you. We rarely, we rarely evaluate our values or question our perceptions until we hit a crisis. And when we hit a crisis, and when we're in deep, 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 deep pain, then we just start going, is this really what life's all about? Living for appearance, feeling good, having the goods, looking good? No, 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 it's gotta be more than that. And when you're in pain, you start saying, well, maybe my perceptions aren't correct. And maybe my values aren't right. See, what happens is we typically cruise through life like this, never stopping to ask the tough questions about our life until we hit the pain. We don't change when we see the light, we change when we feel the heat. And when we hit the crisis, then we start saying, is this a dead end I'm walking down? Is this, is, where is this headed? Am I seeing things correctly? Am I deceiving myself? When things are going great, we don't even ask those questions. But when you get fired from your job, or you go through a divorce, or a loved one dies, or you have a health crisis, all of a sudden these values questions become real. Am I really seeing things correctly? Am I listening to what the world says, or am I listening to what God says? Now one of the greatest weaknesses of our modern culture there are many, but one of the greatest ones is short-term thinking. Our society has taught us that all that matters is here and now. That's all that matters. Tomorrow doesn't matter, next year doesn't matter, a thousand years from today doesn't matter, eternity, heaven certainly doesn't matter. All that matters is here and now. Live for today. And what we're doing is we're giving our allegiance to things that won't last. Here's what the Bible says. The world and its desires will pass away. But those who do the will of God, what? Read it with me. Will live forever. So to live only for here and now is incredibly short-sighted. It's incredibly short-sighted. Now when you are tempted, I don't care what temptation is bad for you. I don't care where, what's your weakness. When you're tempted, temptation is never just between right and wrong. Temptation is not just between good and bad. Temptation is not just between what's best and what's not best. Temptation is always a, is always a, a, a dilemma between now or later. Now or later. Am I gonna do what God says and enjoy the benefits later or am I gonna do what I want and enjoy the benefits now? Every temptation really comes down to now or later. And it's true with my money. Am I gonna spend it now or am I gonna save it and enjoy it later? Invest it in heaven? But with my money, with, with my schedule, am I gonna do what's easy for me to now or am I gonna do the tough thing now and enjoy the benefit later? With my mouth, am I gonna say what I really would like to say right now or am I gonna hold it back and enjoy the benefit of, of it later? Temptation always between now and later. And so I have to ask the question, what's going to last the longest? 2 Corinthians 4.18 says this. We focus, we focus our attention, this is a key to success, not on what we can see around us, but what we cannot see with our eyes. For everything that we see, all the physical things on earth, is temporary, everything that is seen is temporary. This building is temporary, it's not gonna last forever. This, this table's not gonna last forever. The things we see are temporary and will only last a short time, but what is unseen is eternal and will last forever. So the first question is, what's gonna be my authority? The second question is this question of what's gonna last the longest? Third question that will determine your destiny Will I choose what's easy or what's best? Oh man, 
We face this every single day of our lives in a thousand different ways. Will I choose what's easy or what's best? In other words, am I gonna actually live what I claim to believe? Now, living by your values is called alignment. Living by your values is called integrity. Living by your values is called congruence. Now, this is redundant, but is it, isn't it easier to do what's easy? Duh, that's why they call it easy. It's easier to do what's easy than to do what's right. And a thousand times a day, I get a choice between what's easy and what's right. Okay, what's easy and what's best. When I do the right thing, that's called congruence. It's called alignment with what I say I believe. Now why do I point this out? George Gallup did a survey of Americans and he discovered the number one cause of stress in America. He said the number one cause of stress in America is what he called incongruent values or incongruent lifestyle. What does that mean? We're not living what we say we believe. We believe one thing and we act in another way. And he said, you weren't wired for that, your body wasn't wired for it, and that's what makes you stressed out, nervous, under tension, because incongruent values, when we say we believe this and we act in a different way, it doesn't work. So I've gotta figure out, will I choose what's easy or will I choose what's best? Now, I've asked Mike Brook, who's our college pastor, to come and talk about what that may mean in a practical way. Would you give a warm welcome to Pastor Mike? Hey, buddy. Thanks, Pastor. So here's the question. Will I live what I claim to believe? Will we live what we claim to believe? Because you see, spiritual maturity is not about just what we know but it's how quickly we change and react to the word of God. And so there's four areas in our life that we may need to change and make changes this week. And so you might write these down on your outline. The first one is if I live what I claim to believe, that may mean changing what I watch and what I read. And here's the question, what are you filling your mind with? Are you filling your mind with what's right or with junk? The average person by the age of 65 has watched nine and a half years worth of television. Isn't that unbelievable? Nine and a half years. I took one of the hours of those years and I watched this uh, documentary and it's called Super Size Me and maybe you've seen it. And in this documentary, this man who's a healthy man takes 30 days and he eats nothing but McDonald's morning, noon, and night. He's only allowed to order off the McDonald's menu. And by the end of his time, by the end of the month, he was sick, he was overweight, had serious health issues, and he said, every day I just feel gross. And what he was trying to prove is that while fast food is easy, you can't live on fast food without there just being some serious repercussions to living on only fast food. And some of us in our lives, we wonder why we struggle in our relationship with Christ, but we've been filling our mind with nothing but junk food this whole time. In fact, in Psalm 119, 37, it says, turn my eyes away from worthless things. God, would you focus my eyes on things that are important? And so here's the thing. Do your media habits represent what you say is important to you? Or let me put it this way. Do you fill your mind with as much scripture and as much truth as you do with Netflix and internet surfing? That's a good question to ask yourself. And if, if you'd say those are out of line, maybe it's time for a change. If we live what we claim to believe, the second change we might, it might mean is that we need to change some friends. Do your friendships build you up or are they pulling you away from Jesus? It might mean we need to make some changes. And here's the thing, it's important for us to have people that we're influencing, but you can't surround yourself with people that are far from God and expect to grow closer to God. As Pastor Rick always says, you can't soar with the eagles if you're gonna run with the turkeys. <laughs> but here's the thing, who you run with dictates how you run the race. And many of us hope to run well in the race of life, but if you're surrounding yourself with people that don't do you any good, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Don't be misled. 
bad company corrupts good character. It also says in Exodus 23 too, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. This is why at this church we talk so much about small groups. And if you're in this room and not in a small group, you can go out to the patio later on and get into a small group. I wanna tell you, you need to be surrounded with people that love you and are gonna lead you towards Jesus. This is why we make sure from the time of your kids through students, junior high, high school, college, all the way through adults, we have small groups available. And if your friends are doing nothing but dragging you down, maybe it's time to make a change. The third area you might need to change is maybe living out what we believe means changing how I spend my money. And here's the question. Is most of your money spent on selfish things or are you generous where you can be? See, we might not be able to be generous in every area and every opportunity, but are you taking opportunities to be generous where you can? The Bible says, Jesus gives words saying, don't store up things on this earth. But he says in Matthew 6, 19 to 20, don't store up treasures here on earth where they can erode away or may be stolen. Store them in heaven where they will never lose their value. The only way to secure your money is by actually being generous with it and storing up the treasures in heaven and leaving a legacy The fourth area that living what you believe might mean we have to change. It might mean changing how I treat other people. It might mean I have to change the way I treat other people. As Pastor Rick has said many times, the Bible tells us that we're to use things and love people. And when we confuse these last two areas, we end up using people to get things. And what I see in Jesus and what you see from Jesus in the Bible is if you wanna be great, you need to become a servant. In fact, in one of his very last times, what he does in his last moments is he wraps a towel around his waist, gets down on his knees and washes his disciples' feet. And he says things like, no servant is greater than their master, demonstrating if I'm this great, I, you should be able to serve just as much as I did. And he even uses phrases like, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then you're going to have to become a servant of all. Or phrases like, the first will be last, and the last will be first. Showing greatness in the kingdom comes by how you serve and love others. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5.16, it says, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, saying this. The world's point of view is use people to get things. God's point of view is use things to love people. And so here it is. It's it's tough to to do these things. It's not easy to accomplish all these things, to ask these questions, to make the changes. In fact, what's easy is to keep living in the moment, to keep doing what feels right right now. A few years ago, I, I ran a marathon. It's the only time I've ran a marathon. And I made, if you don't know what a marathon is, it's 26.2 miles of running consecutively. And I made the decision to run a marathon while I was in my bedroom, in my bed, eating ice cream, watching Biggest Loser. That's, I wish I was making that up. (laughs) But I was watching the show and I went, they made the contestants run a marathon. I went, I'm gonna run a marathon this year. And so I gave myself six months to train and I woke up the next morning, laced up my shoes and went, I'm gonna run as far as I can until I'm tired. I made it maybe a mile. And I got to the mile and I was like, I only gotta do this 26 more times to get to the end. That's a, I'm not doing well. But over the course of six months, I trained and ran every day. And I remember the night before the marathon, I was sitting with my wife and my brother and they said, are you excited for the race tomorrow? And I was like, no. (laughs) I'll be excited when I'm at the finish line and and I'm done running tomorrow. my brother said something that was so profound, and I don't think he knew how profound and how much this stuck out to me, but he said, Mike, you've trained. Now sit back and enjoy the challenge and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And that's exactly what I did for the first 18 miles. 
And about mile 18, my hips started to hurt and I wanted so bad to stop. And I remember looking and going at mile 19, I'm stopping and I'm gonna stretch because that's just gonna feel so good to stretch. And at mile 19, I'm looking ahead and I see a guy who stops and stretches and I'm kind of drooling a little bit going, oh my gosh, that looks like that feels so good. That's exactly what I need right now when I get to that mile marker. And then he falls over. And he waves, and the medical team lifts him off. And I'm like, don't stop running. Just keep going. Just keep on going. And so I ran by it. No joke. In the remaining eight miles I had, I saw six people drop off the race. The last one was at mile 25 with the finish line in view. And I remember thinking, please don't stop. And he stopped, and that was it. And here's the thing. Many of us in our race of life, in our journeys, It'll feel, we think it'll feel so good to just stop and stretch. You know what I need? I just need to stop and stretch my mind. I need a, a mental break, and so I'm gonna escape. You know what I need? I just need to escape with some friends that aren't gonna remind me. I just need to escape with my finances and be selfish. I can escape with the way I treat people. And here's the thing. I want you to run the, way, the race well. I want you to run the, way, the race in such a way that at the end, you hear from Jesus, well done, my good and faithful servant. And here's how that happens. Some of you are going, these are four changes. They're not easy, and of course not. But we don't have to do this on our own. In fact, in Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do everything God asked me to with the help of Christ, who gives me the strength and the power. Meaning, you're not running this race on your own. You don't have to do this on your own power but we have the power of Jesus behind us. So Pastor Rick is gonna come by and teach point four. Thank you. Now, as Mike was saying, it's not easy to live for the truth. It's not easy to live for Christ. It's not easy to have good godly values when everything in the world is the exact opposite. If it were easy to live for Christ, everybody would do it. There's a reason why everybody does not live for Christ. It's easier. It's easier to be self-centered. It's easier to go the way of the world. It's easier to swim with the fish instead of upstream. And so we come to the fourth question that will determine your destiny. Question number four, is it worth the price? Paul says in Corinthians, if all we have is here on earth, we Christians are most miserable of all. Why? Because it's not easy to live for Christ in a world that doesn't like Christ. And so the Bible tells us this question, is it worth it? Now everything in life has a price tag. Everything in life has a price tag. Anytime you say yes to something, then you're saying no to something else. There's, there's a price to be paid. I did this, so I didn't do that. There's a price to be paid in every area of life. Is the price, is the prize worth the price in following Christ, in doing the right thing, in doing the hard thing, not the easy thing, in living for long-term reward rather than short-term relief? Well, let me just close with a few verses. I'm just gonna go right, one right after another. Matthew 16, 26. Jesus says this, what profit, what profit is there if you gain the whole world and lose eternal life? What can be compared with the value of eternal life? That's a value statement right there. Look up here on the screen. Here's the same verse from the message paraphrase. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? or your soul. What could you ever trade your soul for? Well, I tell you people are trading their soul for a lot of things. They're trading it for sex, they're trading it for drugs, they're trading it for self-centeredness, they're trading it for materialism. A lot of people are trading their soul today. A lot of people are trading their soul. Is it worth it? Absolutely not. It's a poor investment, it's a dumb decision, it's a bad choice. Look at this next verse on the screen. Jesus said, the things that are considered of great value by people 
are worth nothing in God's sight. Question, do you wanna live your life based on what people think's important, or do you wanna live your life based on what God thinks important? Which of those two do you think's gonna matter when you die? And you go into eternity and spend trillions and trillions of years in eternity. Which is gonna matter, people's opinion or what God has to say, God's truth? Let me give you one more, look here on the screen. Mark 10, 31. Jesus said, many people who seem to be important now will be the least important then. Don't ever spend a second of your life trying to be a celebrity. Don't ever spend a second of your life trying to be famous. Why, because one minute you're a hero, the next minute you're a zero. Who remembers who was on the cover of Time two weeks ago? Nobody. The only person who remembers is the person who had their picture on Time two weeks ago. <laughs> and they'll, they'll cherish that the rest of their life. He says, many people who seem to be important now will be the least important in eternity. Now I, I said earlier, that every temptation is a choice between short-term relief and long-term reward. But it's also something else. Every temptation is always a choice between God or me. In every temptation, I am choosing either God or I'm choosing me. It's not just good and evil, right and wrong, better and best. It's a choice. Every temptation is a choice between what God has said to do, or what I want to do, God or me. That is a fatal flaw, to choose what I want instead of what God wants. Now, some of you have been coming to Saddleback, and some of you are at the campuses, and you're watching this, and um, you've been thinking about becoming a Christian, you haven't become a Christian, you haven't stepped across the line, maybe you come with your spouse, or a boyfriend, or girlfriend, or a friend, and you haven't stepped across the line. As a pastor who loves you, I just need to be real honest with you. I need to be real honest with you before you make the decision to give your life to Jesus Christ. You cannot follow Christ without a shift in your values. Sorry, you can't. You can't say, I'm gonna follow Christ, and by the way, live like hell. I wanna to go to heaven, but I wanna live like hell. I wanna to go to heaven, but I wanna be the judge of my own life. I wanna choose what I wanna do. I'm gonna to listen to me, not what the Bible says. Uh, I wanna do what the, what the world says is important. And I'm gonna spend most of my life trying to look good, trying to feel good, and try to have the goods. You can't. Don't even, don't even waste your effort. You can't. Following Christ requires something called repentance. Now, we don't understand that word because nobody uses it anymore. When, when people say the word repentance, they think of a guy on the street with a sandwich sign that says, turn or burn. <laughs> You're gonna die and fry while we go to the sky. You know, it's like holding up a big sign, repent. Repentance is not a bad word. It actually simply means, it's the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. That's all it means. Repent means to change your mind. It means to say, I used to think this, but now I think this. I used to value this, but now I value this. I used to think this was important, but now I know this is what's really important. You can't follow Jesus without repenting. You can't follow Jesus without a change in your value system. I'll close with this verse from Paul, Philippians chapter three. Paul says this, it's a personal story, his personal testimony. Paul says, you know, <clears throat> I once thought that all these things, the things in the world, the, what the world values, I once thought all these things were so very important, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done for me. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. That's a value statement. All the stuff the world thinks cool, it's garbage, it's not worth it. So that I may have him. Now let me close by giving you a new definition of success. Definition of success, not having the goods, looking good and feeling good. Success is living by the values that God will reward someday. That is real success. 
living my life by the values that God will reward someday. Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. That'll determine your destiny. Let's bow for prayer. Possessions aren't gonna last, so why spend your whole life trying to pile those up? Popularity isn't gonna last. Prestige isn't gonna last. Pleasure isn't gonna last. Power isn't gonna last. What is gonna last is what God says. Let me pray for you, and then I wanna ask you to pray with me. Lord, you know we've all been seduced by the values of today's culture. It's just hard to think clearly when we're constantly bombarded with false messages and catalogs and movies and songs and the internet. It's so easy to think that having the goods and looking good and feeling good is all that life's all about when that's just so peripheral. And Lord, it's, it, it's really easy to assume that because we think or we feel something, that it must be the truth. Help us to realize that perceptions are wrong most of the time. And our feelings are often wrong too. Help us to trust in the truth of your word, not the feelings that we have. Now I invite you to pray. I'll pray a prayer right now and I invite you to follow me in this. Just say, Father, in, in your mind, say, Father, I want my life to count. I've wasted a lot, but I want the rest of my life to count. So I want to build my life on the values that are going to last for eternity. Forgive me for all the times I've thought something was true simply because I felt it or thought it. Help me to remember that my brain doesn't always tell me the truth. Today I want to settle the issue of authority in my life. And I don't want it to be the world and I don't want it to be my feelings. I want it to be your word. I want your truth, the rock of ages, the truth of all the ages to be the final authority on my values of what matters and what doesn't. I don't want what culture says. I don't want what my friends say. I don't even want what I tell myself. I want your truth in your word to be my authority. And I want to choose long-term rewards over short-term relief. You know the urges in my life. You know the passions in my life. You know the desires in my life. I want my money and my time and my mouth to honor you. I want to use them in light of eternity. So Jesus Christ, today you said we can do all things through your strength. So give us the strength, give me the strength to choose what's best over what's easy. Even if that means changing some friends or changing what I watch or read. Even if it means changing how I spend my money or even changing how I treat other people. Help me to know what matters most based on your word so that my life will matter for eternity. And I humbly ask this in your name. Amen.